A bit lit, celebrating research and creativity of all kinds. Hello and welcome to this session for the TIDE conference entitled Where Do Animals Belong? Uh, we are the box office Bears Project and we'll introduce ourselves in just a moment. But we wanted to start by introducing um, a list of names published in 1638. Um, those names are Ned of Canterbury, George of Cambridge, Don John, Ben Hunt, Nan Stiles, Beef of Ipswich, definitely a porn star, Robin Hood, Blind Robin, Judith of Cambridge, Bess Hill, Kate of Kent, Rose of Bedlam, Nan Talbot, Mole Cutpurse, uh, Nell of Holland, Mad Bess, Will Tukey, Bess Runner, and Tom Doggett. Um, Callan, who are those people? They're bears. <laughs> <laughs> they are bears. A list of bears published in 1638 as part of um, uh, John Taylor's Bull, Bear, and Horse. Um, and this, uh, this panel will now be exploring the place of animals. Um, but as you can hear there, so many of the bears in this period are named via particular places. Um, so we'll go around and introduce ourselves. My name is Andy Kesson. Um, I'm a literature scholar um, and uh, working with these fine people. Um, Hannah, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello, I'm Hannah O'Regan. I'm at the University of Nottingham and I study bones, but I've also got a very great interest in bears, which is where this project came from. Lizzie. Hello, I'm Lizzie Wright. I'm also based at Nottingham with Hannah, um, and I'm also into bones. I'm a zoo archaeologist or archaeozoologist. So I study the animal remains that are excavated from archaeological excavations. Thank you. Gregor. Hi, I'm Gregor. I am a geneticist uh, interested in domestication and relationships that animals have with people in all of their different guises. I'm based in Oxford, and I run the ancient DNA facility here. Sophie? Hi, I'm Sophie Charlton, and I'm also based at Oxford in the Ancient DNA Lab here. Um, I'm an archaeologist that works uh, in uh, archaeological science, specifically biomolecular archaeology, so using techniques like ancient DNA and stable isotopes and ancient proteins to look and at what kind of information we can find out about past human and animal populations. Great, thank you. And Cal? Uh, hi, I'm Callum Davies. I'm based at the University of Roehampton. Um, He's not a bear. <laughs> I'm, I'm not there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I look at uh, theatre, entertainment history and cultural history. Great. And um, this event will be thinking about migration and animals. But as you can already hear, we are ourselves kind of migrating intellectually beyond our various fields of study. Um, we're not taking for granted any, any knowledge um, on the part of our audience. We're aware that the audience will be from a diverse range of backgrounds, um, not all of them academic. So we're hoping to unpack everything that we can, but we look forward to your questions after the, the panel and do please um, ask them in particular if there is information we weren't clear about. Um, but yes, we're sort of interested in the ways our own fields of knowledge are kind of migrating across each other um, in this work. And one thing I've been struck by as we start this project, we are at the start and this is a work in progress um, event for us. Um, it's just the different speeds that our various, various disciplines work at and the ways in which evidence, the moment at which evidence is produced and how we handle it differs just in terms of tempo, in terms of time, um, particularly at the moment of, of COVID as we've all had to kind of rearrange ourselves at a time when we ourselves can't migrate very easily. We have no freedom of movement. Um, so we, we've confronted this issue in a very literal form. Um, we're going to start then with just a few, um, a few questions to get, our, uh, get us thinking about this particular um, uh, issue. And the first one is simply, what is baiting? What is animal baiting? Um, Hannah, maybe would you start us off with that? Yes, so animal baiting, it, certainly in the early modern context, is uh, having a large animal, a bear, a bull, um, mainly bears and bulls, occasionally lions, other, other animals have been involved, um, tied to a stake and then dogs being set upon it. Um, and the sport being, you know, how many dogs are going to be killed or injured or which part of the bear or bull are they going to bite or attack? Um, and we suspect there's quite a lot of betting going on in the background, but that's the sort of thing that seems to be hidden in the archives. That's the bit that nobody wrote down. Um, so, it, I mean, to us, it's not an entertainment by any means, uh, but at the time, it was, seems to have been very, very popular. You know, it, it was on a par with going to the theatre. Mm. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, and I guess it has lots of different kinds of spatial implications. The, the combat itself is all about where the animals are in the combat arena and who is invading whose personal space. Um, it raises questions about who the audience are, how they've got there. Are they in their, their hometown? Have they traveled far to come to an arena? Um, and then Cal, you've been finding in particular as you start looking through the archives, just how many bears seem to have been traveling England? This is my favorite fact of the project so far. Um, I love the fact that bears stopped traffic in early modern England as people stopped to, to look at this extraordinary animal. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you've been finding about um, animal migration through this work? Yeah, I mean, I think it's quite interesting that um, one of the things that the archive isn't rich on is what goes on in the moment of the baiting arena. But actually, the, the points where we do encounter the bears is where they're journeying from one place to another, where they're on the road, as you say. Um, there's quite a telling uh, glimpse from Canterbury uh, in, I think, the late 16th century, where somebody complains about bears soiling the king's highway. So you have this sense of traffic, kind of the kind of natural pollution coming out of the movement of bears that are going everywhere. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, so traffic regulations, complaints about noise and kind of presence of bears on people's land um, is really at the forefront of a, of a lot of the kind of smaller legal cases. And one of the most surprising things coming out of the work Cal's done is that how often bears randomly enter people's homes. You know, someone loses control of their bear and it just wanders into usually a woman's house, which is kind of interesting, usually a single woman's house. Um, we get quite a few of those anecdotes, which feels very strange. And I guess it's also worth stressing that if you are watching dogs versus bear, you're watching animals strongly associated with Englishness in the form of the mastiff versus an animal which is either associated with the English past with kind of prehistoric period or is thought of as somewhere as a creature that, which represents kind of non-Englishness. Um, and just going back to our list of names with which we opened, um, I'm so fascinated by, you know, Ned of Canterbury, Judith of Cambridge, that kind of almost football style sense that you might perhaps associate yourself with a particular bear based on where it's from. And what would it mean for Ned of Canterbury to be baited in Canterbury as opposed to being baited in Chester? for example. Um, and then the final thing I'll say about this list is I'm really fascinated by the levels of jurisdiction implied by Ned of Canterbury on the one hand and Kate of Kent of the other. Like, is Kate of Kent, is she the boss of Ned of Canterbury? Is that how that works? I'm really interested in this idea of county versus civic um, bear, bareness. Um, okay, so that's, um, that's baiting and getting us thinking about where it happens. Um, we are hoping to think about questions about where they come from and where they belong more broadly in the project. Um, Sophie, perhaps could you talk us through the kinds of information which DNA analysis can give us? Yeah, so um, obviously um, we know that throughout all of human history, people and animals have moved and migrated and gone into different uh, parts of, 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 of both countries and of the globe. Um, and by looking at kind of patterns of genetic variation across populations, both in the present day and in the past, we can start to try and um, piece together those demographic processes um, and we can start to find examples of when mobility might have occurred. Um, so um, in our lab in Oxford, we specifically look at ancient DNA. So um, that's trying DNA from archaeological um, bone or, or tooth remains, from skeletal remains. Um, and the kind of information that can tell us um, is, for example, with our bears, the genetic ancestry potentially of those bears um, and their genetic relatedness, um, as well as their genetic sex. Um, and so we know that bears aren't native to um, Britain in the early modern period. Um, they've been extinct in Britain for about a thousand years. And so we begin to explore using ancient DNA um, the potential um, genetic and even potential origins of where those bears may have originated from and potentially how they, they got to the, the UK. Um, and the other thing we can also do is we can explore whether those bears um, that we're finding in early modern England are um, brown bears or potentially maybe if, if they're um, black bears or polar bears. And in the, the list Andy mentioned at the start, uh, two of the bears in, in that kind of um, pamphlet kind of style um, uh, uh, piece, uh, two of them are listed as being white bears. Um, so it'd be really interesting to us with the ancient DNA to see if we can actually pinpoint that and potentially that uh, suggests that we've got bears coming from even further places away. Um, so that's what we're hoping for. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, that's, and not just the bear, Sophie, right? But also the dogs. Yeah, so, so we can answer, yeah, similar questions with the, the dogs as well. 
Yeah, lovely. And that's a, a really nice example of how the kind of documentary evidence and the DNA evidence might be put into dialogue. Um, it'll be really interesting to see if that dialogue is a conversation or if they're talking past each other or saying completely different things in parallel, you know, be fascinating to see how that goes. But well, given really that we're all academics, it's, it's our role and our, it's, we have to be speaking past each other. We're not allowed <laughs> to actually collaborate and understand each other. We just do this all the time. <laughs> well, with that in mind, I'm going to ignore what Greg had just said <laughs> <laughs> and turn to Lizzie and ask her, um, Lizzie, could you introduce to us the um, work that the zoo archaeology, the work on isotopes um, will do for this kind of uh, work? Yes, so um, what I'm doing on the project is I'm studying the animal remains from a number of different excavations that took place on Bankside in London, where there were a number of bear baiting arenas. Um, and we know that um, it's very clear that some of these uh, assemblage arches are related to the baiting because they're full of dog remains and horse remains that seems like the horses were probably fed to the dogs and also a few bear remains as well. Now, studying the animal bones themselves tells us things like, yeah, what species were there, uh, the ages of the animals when they died. Um, we can look for things like butchery on the bones, which uh, tells us, particularly on the horse remains, we're seeing some butchery um, and also on some other species, cattle um, and sheep. They're probably feet butchering these animals and feeding them to the dogs and potentially the bears as well. And we can also look for gnawing marks on the bones. So anything that was fed to the dogs, we can also look for. So we can start to build a picture of um, the kind of animals that were living um, and dying uh, in the bear baiting areas on Bankside. Um, and then this work will lead, looking into the questions of, around mobility, these, this leads on to um, the isotope work that we're doing. Now, let me just get a prop. How exciting. <laughs> so this is one of the dog skulls that we, uh, that's from Bankside and um, that I've been studying. And we can do various different things with this skull. We can look at what age it was. So we can see that this animal has all of its adult teeth. So we know that it was a mature dog. We can take various measurements on it to see the size of the dogs. Now, in the literature, a lot of these dogs are mentioned as mastiffs. It does seem from what I'm looking at that these were quite large dogs mm -hmm. and almost all of them were large dogs. So the archives, the literature and the zoo archaeology is kind of matching in that sense so far. Mm -hmm. We can also look at uh, what happened to this dog when it died. Now, this dog, you can see here, has a big dent in its skull. It looks like probably this some kind of blow to the head might have been what killed it. There's no healing around this indent. So it seems like this happened and then it died straight away. So now when we talk about the isotopes, in order to look for mobility, to see where these dogs might have come from, we can look at the strontium isotopes in the tooth enamel. So the shiny stuff on the teeth. So the way that this works is that when a dog or other animal is growing up and their teeth are forming and their tooth enamel is forming, the strontium isotopes related to the local geology get absorbed into the tooth enamel. Then you can look at where the dog was found when it was excavated and you can compare the strontium uh, levels in the geology where it was found to the strontium levels in the geology where the animal grew up. And that gives you an idea of if that animal may have moved during its lifetime. So we can see if some of these dogs in Bankside may have been coming from other geological areas of the UK, for example. And um, so for mobility, this is the big thing that we're looking at. We're also looking at other isotopes. We're looking at carbon and nitrogen isotopes to look for diet. So what they might have been feeding the dogs um, as well. So there's a broad range of questions we can answer with these approaches. That's completely fascinating, thank you. It might not be immediately obvious for everyone why um, age at death might be meaningful or significant. Do you mind talking us through that? Yes, so in most of the animals that I found from Bankside so far were adults. This is for the dogs and the horses. Now for the dogs, it seems if you, if you start finding young uh, animals, then you get or especially very young animals, then you get the impression that they may have been breeding them there. 
um, because you always end up with some young animals dying um, where breeding is taking place. Um, but I've so far found, I don't think any or very small number of young dog remains, which implies that the dogs were being bred elsewhere and then the adult dogs were being brought mm. uh, into Bankside for the baiting. Thank you. So for the horses... Yeah. Sorry, Andy, what were you going to no, say? No, no, please. <laughs> For the horses, uh, we see something similar happening. I think I've only found one or two um, uh, specimens from young horses. So they these are, and the, it looks like the horses that we've got are very old. Mm. So these seem like horses that have reached the end of their life. They're quite knackered. Then they've been sent for, you know, being fed to the dogs. Um, yeah. So the, the age of these animals tell us something about their migratory history, um, but also perhaps tell us something about a history of care. Like we think of baiting quite rightly as an act of violence and of cruelty, but the sheer age of these animals also suggests to us um, that they're being looked after, they're being cared for, maybe not the horses, perhaps. Hannah, sorry. Yeah, I was just thinking, I mean, so Cal's been looking in the archives and there are those records of people writing and saying, you've taken my dog. So the, the, the master of the bears had the right to go out from London or send his deputies out from London to collect dogs from elsewhere and bring them back to London, because obviously it was uh, something that went through dogs quite quickly. The bears were probably looked after, but the dogs and may, maybe the dogs were looked after, too, because they do seem to be older animals. Um, but they, they were running out of dogs and you were able, the, the bear, the master of the bears was able to send uh, his deputy out and take people's dogs. And, and Callum's found a few examples of that, haven't you, Cal? Yeah, I suppose there's, yeah. So um, there's, a, I guess, a social network that, that the archive can lay on top of the assemblages that, that Lizzie is looking at that speaks to who is um, passing dogs between um, different places and why they're doing that, I suppose, the kind of social and political um, connections as well as the biological um, ones. Um, the, hens, the, the records that... Philip Henslow and Edward Allen have um, when they were masters of the game. So the people who were appointed by the king to look after his, uh, the royal kind of collection of dogs and bears. Um, and we're very fortunate in the sense that there's a, a sizable and, and well-maintained uh, collection based at Dulwich College in Dulwich Archives um, of, of the kind of correspondence that was involved in, in being master of the game. Uh, and so we have letters coming from people in, let's say, Leicestershire, who are asking them, can we uh, buy off of you a, a young cub? Or why have you taken my dog? You know, someone in Devon kind of complains about that. Uh, and then we get other kind of social and political relations that perhaps explain some of, uh, or, or speak to some of the assemblages on Bankside. Um, so Manchester, uh, the town of Manchester, agree so that they don't get into any kind of hot water. Why have you taken my dog? How dare you come here and, and sort of spring this on us? Uh, they agree regularly to send a dog every single year down to London and sort of sign a, um, a sort of contract stating as much. Um, so we get these kind of very interesting relationships between centralised royal licensed authority and the kind of provincial care that might go into raising dogs and the sort of provincial side of the game. Uh, as well as this centralised one based in Bankside and moving between court locations. Yeah. The other aspect of this that I find so fascinating is that, you know, we think about baiting as something that is, the, the, these, these bears are being attacked by the dogs, but the bears are clearly the stars of the show. And so that the, almost paradoxically, though there's a lot of aggression and a lot of violence is taking place here, you have every incentive to maintain the overall health and well-being of these bears. So it's like it's a temporary assault. And then you won't never allow it to get too far because these are, you know, for lack of a better analogy, they're sort of the Jedi Knights. They're the, the real stars. They're stopping traffic. They are, you know, kind of making a nuisance themselves in terms of their celebrity, whereas the dogs it's almost like they're the stormtroopers. And the, the, the question here about is like, are, how fungible are they? You know, how is it, I mean, how many stormtroopers die in, in all three original Star Wars films? It'd be a, a fun stat to come up with, but are the dogs, if they are being sent down, how do they just have to be big? And is there, and if we have sufficient enough DNA from a lot of these results, we may be able to see if there's relatedness here and how much care and time is going into us getting a dog population 
to be of a particular threshold where these things are the also kind of a semi star of the show, or is it just like every any come one come all the dogs are just kind of um, litter at the end of the day? Nobody really cares about them. And I think that the, there's what all the evidence that you're getting, Cal, is suggesting that maybe there is some importance being placed that it's not just any dog. That these there are there is some matter something that matters about these dogs, and that there is a threshold for like that's acceptable, that is not, and that so therefore they're not just stormtroopers. The, the fungibility of them is actually reduced, which is just fascinating. Yeah, and following on from that, the other thing, because there's been a lot more genetic work undertaken on dogs and archaeological, the other thing that we can um, potentially explore is what those dogs actually might have looked like, the physical kind of characteristics of those dogs. Um, and so that might also might be really interesting to see if they're always choosing dogs that look very similar. So as well as the genetic relatedness, potentially the dogs, also what those dogs might actually have looked like and what kind of physical characteristics they, they might have held. So if you have two white bears, do all of your dogs always have to be black? You know, like that kind of thing. And that's the sort of thing that we could maybe explore through the DNA again, assuming there's enough DNA there for us to interrogate it. Um, I'm thinking about how that question could raise all kinds of questions about understandings of race in the early modern period, which sure. um, delegates of this conference might well want to ask us about. We'd love to hear from you about, about that if anyone has any thoughts. Um, I've got two thoughts from uh, what Sophie and Gregor are saying in response to Cal, and then I'd like to hand back to Cal if that's all right. And the, um, the first one is, my understanding is that dogs sort of divide into two groups. One is a kind of house dog, the dog that belongs, for example, to um, Alain and Henslow, and that they purloined from somewhere around the country, um, and it's sort of therefore representing the, the baiting arena or the baiting producer. Um, but then, am I not right in, in saying that sometimes um, local male aristocrats may come along with their own dogs um, to set up against the bear? And at that point, you know, you have a, an especially kind of allegiance-based animal fighting fighting the bear, an animal that's representing the owner's masculinity, prowess, status, etc. Um, and then just to link from where Gregor and Sophie got back to Cal um, and thinking about travel and needing your bear to be okay the following day, um, uh, Cal, you've done some brilliant work on a bear war diary, which really brings that home where you can see two bears being led around the country by the bear ward, um, and you can follow them on a day-by-day -day basis, and you can see just how, you know, this the entire business structure relies on the bear being okay, not just the following day, but for the following months mm -hmm. to fight again. Do you mind telling us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really fascinating document. It's written in a, a particular, I mean, often handwriting in the period is challenging, um, but this is particularly challenging. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't want to make too many claims about the bear ward's literacy, but it's, it does seem to be kind of a, 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 a working or developed uh, skill at writing, um, often phonetic, more phonetic even than, than spelling typically is in this period. Um, and it's taken as the bear ward is on the road and it, and it kind of looks like that. The materiality of the document is very interesting. It's a, it's a on the road, you know, diary or account book, a memo book. Um, and as Andy's saying, it, it charts this journey that comes out from London um, and moves towards the Southwest. It goes via Reading all the way down to kind of Salisbury up into the Cotswolds and past Gloucestershire, and then it loops back round towards London. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the startling things that come, comes out of this is once you've tabulated where they're going and, and how many times the bears seem to be performing per day, um, you know, it's quite a gruelling schedule. They're moving really, really quickly across the country and then doing a, a performance, a, a sort of game night after night. But there are some, you know, and whilst this is, of course, framed by this kind of sense of cruelty and exploitation, there are quite surprisingly tender moments that, that come out um, simply in this account book where, where expenses are recorded. I mean, one instance is, so we know one of the bears that they were traveling with was blind um, because uh, the bear ward notes down an expense for oil to treat the blind bear. So there's this sort of sense of, you know, complicated by economic um, sustainability I suppose out of the game um, but also an, an essential need to kind of care and care for the animals and make sure that they can do that that journey and also to care for the human beings who are also uh, accompanying the game because it's not just a solo bear war there's at least two other people one of whom seems to be a butcher um, and there are numerous expenses for sort of repairing their shoes so there's a kind of human animal uh, yeah, kind of connection that, to do with this journey that, that the diary speaks to, which is really fascinating. Cal, are there any instances that you've been able to find where the bear might go rogue and somebody gets, a human being gets injured rather than a dog? Mm. In fact, that diary is very interesting in, in the 
uh, ambiguity of its phrasing because a, a number of the expenses that the bear ward has to put aside is for the harm that the bears have done. Uh, and that could simply mean they've destroyed the barn there in but you know obviously it could mean something potentially more sinister but but as andy was saying there are a couple of glimpses from often quarter sessions records or kind of legal documents and indictments where uh either the bears themselves have escaped or someone has kind of unloosed them uh and they've uh, gone towards into people's houses broken through windows these these kind of things where the bear sort of seems to be rogue um but i suppose what's interesting is that you don't typically put a bear on trial. So the people who are being blamed for this kind of behavior are actually the, the unruly um, people who've, who've occasioned it in the first place, rather than the bear who is just being a bear really in public. And so it's not, yeah, it's not. So is there an analogy with like a rock star in a hotel room thing here? Like the, the celebrity can get away with anything, but it's the people who are handling them who are the ones who get persecuted? <laughs> exactly. Nice. Yeah. But also there's that, sort of potential tension with being the bear ward. You are not from the local town, but you're arriving with your bear, which may have that local rivalry name. And I'm just thinking of sort of rivalry between Ipswich Town and Norwich City that, that I grew up with in East Anglia. You know, you're arriving with this bear that may have the name of your rival town. And the trouble that comes with that, um, or potential trouble that comes with that, when you've got people coming together for an aggressive sport with their own dogs, probably beer being involved would that be fair to say do we think drinking is happening um you know there, there's there's interesting ideas about the movement of those people and the and the animals and and what that means to be a bear ward walking into a town that you don't know and the danger that that might put you in in terms of your you know your safety I think, I mean, it kind of brings it back to, to what Andy was saying at the start about this, this early signs of fan culture, which is regionally based or regionally attached. And um, I mean, one good example is the only surviving bill or advertisement for uh, baiting in this period, which stems from at some point in the early 17th century, advertises gamesters of Essex, who are the ones who are bringing their dogs to, you know, and, and that's what the trial is, that there, there's a real regional competition involved in that and, and sort of other accounts across the country show Lancashire men, Cheshire men and Londoners sort of having this kind of uh, friction or competitiveness about the sport. And you've been finding some evidence in which, you know, some some people are just simply not welcome um, in a particular town on the basis of where they, where they are from as they try to join in um, events like this. So you get this real sense of the kind of politics of national movement um, and regionalism, regionalism against that notion of, of fan culture, right? It brings people together and it's very divisive um, at the same time. Um, I feel like the form of migration we haven't quite covered yet is who might be in the audience for these events, perhaps particularly at the baiting arenas. And one of the striking things about the evidence for the baiting arenas is how often um, it comes. Like um, eyewitness reports come from visiting dignitaries and other kinds of visiting foreigners coming to London. Do we have a sense of why you would take your, your non-local chum to a baiting event? I'm looking at Hannah or Cal in particular, Hannah. Okay, well, it's, it's a royal sport. So the really high ranking ones, the ambassadors and people are taken. You know, it is the royal sport. So I suppose there's that level of patronage that's happening there, um, but also, there's that question about the dogs, which, you know, in terms of bear baiting, we always think about the bear, but the dogs, and you mentioned at the start about sort of the Englishness of the animal and to what extent some of it is actually showcasing the prowess of these English dogs. Because I believe that there were, I think there's something in the Henslow Allen archives that says that you need a license to be able to export these mastiffs from Britain, or from England, sorry. Um, and so that suggests that the the dogs themselves are, have a value in terms of what they represent and that they may be being given as gifts to people. So I wonder as much as it's about the sport and the, the spectacle, it's also about perhaps the animals. I wonder if there's also an architectural element to that as well. Um, I mean, you know, the period that we're looking at sees the, the development of these large permanent or, or sort of regular um, structures on Bankside and I think we're finding also elsewhere in the country 
which house the, the, these animals and sort of the infrastructure behind them. Um, and a number of those eyewitness accounts um, that Andy's talking about reference how um, sizable and kind of impressive they are to visit. So, so you've got a kind of yeah, a physical representation of, of the um, importance of the animals to the sport too. So, yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating, I think, the pull that this event has on audiences and even just having a collection of um, baiting arenas and theatres on, on South Bank is an invitation for Londoners and perhaps others to come there, you know, to make that journey to come there, but then also to mingle and to travel amongst strangers. You don't even need to go into one of the arenas or the theatres in order to see, see the local animals, you know, local in the sense of attached to the baiting arena. Um, so we're kind of heading towards a version of an early modern zoo, I think. Um, so again, they're they are invitations to travel, aren't they, these sorts of events? these sorts of spaces. Um, and Cal's been showing us how baiting in towns is often right at the center of the town, you know, um, the spaces for baiting. Hannah was talking about beer earlier and bear and beer. There are lots of weird ways in which words collapse into each other. We keep seeing the word baiting spelt as beating, which in some ways might be a better term for what's happening in terms of the violence. Um, but you know, the bear in and the baiting spaces in the town seem to be again and again, right at the center of the community. But again, an invitation to come into that center Hannah, I think you're about to come in then. That's exactly what I was going to mention. You know, the fact that although we don't have these necessarily formalised arenas in the way that you have in South Bank and all of the other towns, the baiting is still happening there, um, sort of perhaps in the marketplace or, or some, other, uh, some other space large enough to take the people. But it's not always outdoors, is it? I yeah. think some of the work that we've been um, looking at, and particularly that Callan's pulling out of the archive, is suggesting that sometimes it's happening indoors as well, which... To me, sounds absolutely mad. You know that that we would be that you would put a bear and a dog in an enclosed space with people in it and and beer and you know let them let them have it. Um, it, it Only good things like... can come from that combination. <laughs> but exactly, it's a health and safety nightmare, Gregor. It's a health and safety nightmare. But but um, you know I, that that does seem to be coming out. I think wasn't Callum? Wasn't there one? Was it from Cheshire where they said it was so full? If you dropped something, you couldn't pick it up or something. That's right, yeah. So full because of the bear baiting that the person dropped his pint and was very upset because <laughs> he couldn't collect it again. Yeah. And I mean, you know, so that's happening in that very popular side of things. But it's also happening at court. So, you know, if we're thinking of Paris Garden and these animals are, there's a, a hyper-local traffic to the way they move around the... London adjacent court sites, one of which includes the banqueting house, you know, which we think of nowadays as a, um, well, I mean, and it was an extremely cutting edge, after, after it was rebuilt by Inigo Jones, an extremely cutting edge uh, piece of Renaissance architecture. And here we have yearly payments for bears being taken into the space, as far as we know, and for, uh, for them to be, um, for the sport to take place there, which, which seems anathema to a hyper-decorated kind of space. I'm intrigued, and this might be a bit of a tangent, but it's clear from the number of, the, the number of people who are attending and, and how attractive this is, that there's a real prestige to all of this at the time as well. And if that's the case, I remember, Cal, you saying that these, in order to be a bear ward, in order to be the one in charge of all this and keep the records and maintain the bear and everybody else around it, that you had to have some sort of permission or sort of taxi cab medallion thing that was then given to you by the powers that be that allowed you to fulfill this role. And that because of the prestige, there were people who were running sort of a counterfeit operation and pretending to be official bear wards when they were not. Is that, am, am I misremembering that? No, I think, I think that's right. I don't know how other people um, were sort of reading the different evidence connecting to that and it's, uh, and the way it's dispersed across the country, but and you so know, that's the question mark, right? Where so it depends on where these where this official permission is coming from, and is that speaking to what Andy was saying before about the power structure of regionalism within England at the time? Like, if you were the further away you were from London, could you were you more likely to get away with pretending to be a bear ward because it took such a long time to get one officially from London? So, it just you know, it, in other words, could you were you more likely to go rogue and get your own bear somehow and pretend to be all this because of the associated prestige associated with the, with the activity. Mm. And that, that brings around to, to a real question of regional identity, um, which, you know, we've been concentrating a lot on Cheshire. And one of the reasons for that is, um, at least archivally, it's very, very rich. Um, but one of the reasons it's archivally rich is because after a certain date, the local authorities 
decided they wanted to crack down on these kind of unlicensed bear wards and they didn't want people just roaming around, whereas maybe some other counties were much more lax about that. So we don't know how, how, how big it is there. But yeah, there seems to be a real um, identity in parts of Cheshire connected to bear baiting. And there are still folk songs, I believe, from places like Congleton, where they, they sing about the Congleton bear and things. So, yeah. I mean, that's an interesting be the next sea shanty song, right? The bear baiting song? Yeah. I mean, when the tonguing is done or when the baiting is done, one of the two, right? it's, it's cruel to either way. <laughs> I think I'd like to sum up where we've got to now. And then um, I'd like to end just by coming back to Sophie and Lizzie, who started off thinking about um, the work that they're doing and just getting a sense of um, how so much of the kind of conversations um, that's ranged through how baiting happens. Um, across early modern England, how that then speaks to the research you're doing to dovetail back to that, if that's okay. Um, but, you know, our, our prompt was, where do animals belong? And I love the way we thought about baiting as a sport which actually asks that question. You know, it puts animals into each other's space and asks them to contest one another for it. Um, we thought about baiting um, bears, uh, in particular, traveling around the country, um, bringing with them regional significance and a sense also of not belonging, um, perhaps. Um, Hannah was asking about the health and safety nature <laughs> implications of baiting inside. I mean, in a, in a way, maybe that's the point, but you know, it, it's a, an event which is asking, do these animals belong in this human made space? Um, and the, the danger in, inherent in that, not least of losing your fear, I'd be terrified if that happened to me. Um, you know, it's, it's asking exactly those questions. Do animals belong in this um, human space? Um, so yeah, I think uh, I've really enjoyed where we've got to so far. Um, as I said at the start, though, I think that our work is particularly exciting just at the level of methodology and discipline and asking where animals belong in our own work and how we migrate um, in terms of, uh, you know, how, our, how our, our intellectual ideas and our questions and our evidence migrate from our respective fields. So we've kind of had a, a good portion there thinking about the archival records and where that's taking us. Um, Sophie and Lizzie, do you have any final thoughts for us about how we might map those onto the kinds of work that you're doing? Um, maybe if we start with Sophie. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I think for the one thing that for me is interesting as well is that when we're bringing together all the different strands of the, the research project is that we can look at of different scales so we can look at kind of um where animals might have been coming from so perhaps if bears are coming from a very long distance if the dogs are coming from a shorter distance and then also the mobility which we can see through the archival archival work of um those animals then once they arrive in in england where they're being moved around the country um, so yeah, for me, I think it's really interesting in that both the ancient DNA, the isotopes and the archival work can address this kind of uh, questions of mobility and migration and movement on, on kind of different scales. So for me, I think that's something that's really interesting and exciting and something you don't often often get on, on, on a research project. So yeah, for me, I think that's something that will be really interesting for us to kind of explore further. Thank you. Lizzie? I mean, from a zooarchaeology uh, perspective, uh, um, we are also going to be doing some comparative work with other sites in London. So we'll be able to have a look at what the dogs are looking like on Bankside compared to other uh, well-known sites. Uh, and then that will give us a sense of whether the patterns we're seeing are very much a baiting Bankside uh, thing or it's a kind of more London-wide thing. And some of these issues around mobility feed into that as well, you know, was London a big hub where dogs were coming from lots of different places in general, or was this very much because of the baiting? Um, so I think, yeah, it's worth uh, bearing in mind that the, it also tells us about the bigger picture about what's happening with animals and where they belong in the UK during the early modern period in general. Yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, I love the idea of mobility of different scales, and I love the idea of interrogating where things fit in London and beyond in, in the early modern world. Um, and I also love Cal's idea of the social network of the archival world um, laying on top of the kind of isotope work um, that's happening from the project. Um, thank you so much, guys. And um, we'll now hand over to the delegates of the conference. We look forward to taking your questions. <laughs>